Hello again, everyone, and thank you for sticking with us. As, a, as I mentioned before, I'm Lloyd Proctor with the BizNow team. Again, we wanna make sure that we give everyone an opportunity to explore the expo floor. So feel free to refer to your left once we are concluded with the discussions. Um, I wanted to give a special shout out and thank you to our sponsors because without them, these sessions of course are not possible. So thank you to PCS Data Center Solutions Inc. And now without further ado, of course, we're here to discuss the edge. I wanna turn things over to this session's moderator, Bruce, to provide an introduction of himself and of course, our esteemed panelists. It's over to you, Bruce. You're on mute. Bruce, you're on mute. You're on mute, Bruce. Gotta hit star six. Bruce, you have to hit star six. There you go. There you go. I apologize for that. I don't know how that happened, but there we are. Uh, I'm Bruce Taylor. I'm the co-founder and managing director of a 501c3 foundation the Smart Nations Foundation. Uh, our mission is to develop uh, digital infrastructure, data centers, clean energy, uh, high-speed, low-latency networks in emerging and developing countries. And the theory behind that is that uh, if we in the Western world, uh, in the wealthier world, do not step in and help the emerging and frontier economies uh, to participate in digital transformation in the digitalization era, uh, they're going to get left behind yet again. Uh, so that's what we're about. Um, I'm going to turn this next to uh, Pete Seiko to uh, introduce himself, and uh, we're off. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Pete Sacco, president and founder of PTS Data Center Solutions. We've been designing data centers for 20 plus years now, everything from co location facilities mostly enterprise facilities, um, all the way down to what we're going to talk about today, uh, the new and evolving edge uh, data centers. Nicole Flores, please. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Nicole Flores. I'm the founding team member, one of the founding team members of Flipside Security. I'm also our CISO. I'm a 24 year veteran of the cybersecurity industry and an internationally recognized subject matter expert and cybersecurity. TJ? Hello, uh, Tony Johnson, no, it's TJ. Uh, I've been in IT for almost 30 years now. I've done everything from uh, helping to design uh, data centers to modular data centers to cloud uh, to IoT devices. I've designed some IoT devices as well. And so uh, the connection of all of these edge, cloud, IoT is kind of right up my alley and hopefully I can contribute. Frank McCann. Hi, uh, my name is Frank McCann. I'm a principal engineer with Verizon Wireless. Um, I've been working in the cellular world since 1995 and at least a couple of decades of that has been in the, in the data center environment. Our enterprise solutions are, are homegrown and uh, what we like to play in our own sandbox, so. And San Diego, I think you're on mute. There we go, okay, thank you. Hi, how are you everybody? Thanks for, for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Santiago Suinaga. I'm from, uh, I have in the data center industry for over 16 years. Uh, uh, the company I work with is uh, Kio Networks. Kio Networks is uh, the largest co-location data center provider in Mexico and Central America. So we have over 40 data centers spread in five countries. And uh, we have core data centers, but also ditch data centers. We have deployed recently in the last couple of years uh, around 16 edge uh, data center locations covering different parts of uh, tier two cities in Mexico. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Thank you all, welcome. Um, so I, I'm going to start this with just a very quick statement. Uh, one of the things in our uh, briefing call uh, was that there was kind of this general sense, and I see it permeate in the industry, that the edge is uh, lagging in adoption, uh, that the technology on the uh, digital infrastructure side, uh, facilities infrastructure side, data center is in place. Uh, but the applications for it are not being developed rapidly enough. I want to take a little bit of exception to that. 
we're going to close out the year 2021 at an estimated uh, 6.29 billion in revenues in this nascent industry. And the seven year projection to 2008 uh, is that we're going to be uh, 61.14 billion. This is from Grandview Research. Uh, that's a CAGR of 38.4%. So there's nothing sleepy about this industry on a global basis. And I think it's going to proliferate uh, f faster than, than any of us think. Uh, so, uh, Pete, I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. So, Pete, Sock, no problem. Uh, uh, the first question to you is, how is it that we are now defining the edge? Give us your best, your best take. Great. Well, as we discussed as a group just the other day, really, for me, the edge takes two shapes, right? And so the edge that we've been talking about is the edge of the data center edge is that edge that Gartner's been describing as that enterprise edge of interplay with a more regional data center whose main purpose is to connect to the cloud. So an enterprise that has this um, cloud first strategy, it isn't only cloud only, it's how do I present my data wherever I have people, technologies, IOT, I'm manufacturing, I'm a hospital, I'm doing something. How do I communicate to deep thinking out to the cloud, but exchange my data somewhere in there? as opposed to the idea of edge being in every rural facility for complete content delivery. So when we hear that the edge application isn't being developed fast enough, that's what I think of. I think of the farmer who's going to be doing analytics on his farm in the middle of you know, Iowa somewhere, that guy connecting to that I IoT edge. All the smart cars of the world communicating as they drive from coast to coast, communicating with a cell tower to cell tower, that application is yet to be developed, but it surely is on its way because I believe we'll all not be driving cars inside the next 10 years. So I think that the definition of the edge is kind of what cloud was when it first came out. It's kind of all over the map right now. Thank you for that. TJ, you have a reflection coming from the cloud side of things particularly? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's many more areas where I see integration to modular data centers and much smaller form factor edge data centers that are connecting to the cloud today than, than ever before. Uh, you know, a great example, Pete, was uh, agriculture, right? So I have a client that does that today and, and they have uh, field devices that have Raspberry Pis and they connect to sensors, right? So is the Raspberry Pi the edge or is the sensor the edge, right? So, you know, you can kind of define it how you want to. Um, but in essence, uh, I agree, Peter. I think it's, it's an end device connected to something in the middle of the regional center or something like that that connects to a larger, either the cloud or even a larger data center, right? Right. So, yeah, no, 100% agree. And San Diego, uh, you've developed uh, for the edge. What's been your experience? You know, uh, the edge uh, is here to, to stay and grow because uh, we have heard about the, the convenience of the edge. So I'll say that the edge will be the convenience. Apparently it wasn't that convenient. And we, we lost what you said last, you, you blanked uh, for a second. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. So I said that the edge is like the convenience store of the data center. So it's like the, the, the most, um, the closest, the closest uh, access to the data. So um, uh, we have been uh, over the years becoming more latency sensitive, right? And uh, more, more urgent to have the data uh, right in our hands because applications have evolved, evolve and require faster response. So the edge is, could be the only way to provide that faster response over the new requirements of the application. So I'll, I'll say that the edge is still uh, on the early stages and we'll see an explosion of edge infrastructure around every, every corner in different countries of the world. Frank? Um, I think Santiago nailed it pretty well there and, uh, and, and so did everyone else and so far, TJ and Pete. And it's the, the edge is whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, what do you call money? Is money your credit card? Is money the money that's in your pocket? It all has to perform. It's all what you're going to use it for. The advent of these higher and 
faster speed. I, I say advent of these high speed connections, but the definition of high speed changes every time something faster comes along. Um, the Model T was pretty darn fast in its day, but not anymore. So our edge is our edge today. Is it going to stay the edge or is the processing power going to go up so much that that's no longer considered the edge? We have to call it edgy, edgier. I don't know. Um, so the, the cell sites could be the edge, the, the regional uh, hubs, the, the main hubs. Um, main hubs I really wouldn't call the edge, but they reach some of the local stuff. So maybe they are the edge. It's, it's, it's up for you know, interpretation. So it's, it all depends on what you want to call it, how you want to use it. So Nicole, uh, while this really isn't uh, a, a security area from uh, this particular framing, it seems to me that the IoT edge, particularly if we think of it in, in that concept where we're talking about literally in some applications, tens of thousands of monitors and sensors uh, feeding data back to a uh, to a server room or server closet or whatever. From your perspective, from a design standpoint, what are the unique attributes of the edge from a security, uh, both physical facilities security and, uh, and a cyber or data securities, network security perspective? Well, it's really interesting because whenever you're dealing with a nascent technology that hasn't been clearly defined, that even you have this immense capacity for growth and innovation, at the same time you have the same emerging threats and concerns from a cybersecurity standpoint. And it's very difficult when you're designing and there is not that clear um, definitive or finite beginning and end, okay, what am I protecting? And at the same time, from a standardization standpoint, which is really what helps push innovation in, in many senses, it kind of creates a, a potential for even more emerging threats. So the idea is always you're innovating from a, a secure standpoint and you're getting ahead of the threat. You don't want to be like right now, one of the main concerns we see with edge computing is uh, node replication. Also encryption algorithms, how are we gonna deploy encryption and ensure privacy and security? If the IoT is the edge and all this uh, personal information is stored on these devices, how are we securing it? Is the data in transit? How's that data being encapsulated and encrypted? How's it being decrypted? How are we protecting against man in the middle attacks? Without that clear definition, it does create somewhat of a bottleneck from a security standpoint which can be overcome through further innovation, but it's always a consideration that we're looking at it from obviously not just from the top down, but for holistically. And uh, Pete, I'm gonna come back to you for a second because uh, on your website, I note that you speak about uh, Edge as an IAS. Uh, uh, yep, Edge as a service. And, and uh, you, in fact, find, I, it, was, it strikes me that at the, at the micro edge, right, the half cabinet uh, or, or smaller right. uh, site, which will what a lot of IoT edge will eventually be. And as TJ said, a Raspberry Pi the size of a, you know, a small apple. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, it, from, from your perspective, is do you see uh, infrastructure as a service growing in this sector? Yeah, I think it will. And uh, you know, to that point, I think the edge has four attributes from a workload standpoint that I see most readily. One, uh, as we've talked about, there has to be a certain level of autonomy. If it disconnects from the rest of the world, it needs to continue to operate. And two, as TJ alluded to, it's uh, or Santiago, it's low latency, right? So it has to have attributes of low latency, which kind of lends itself to it. Also requires lots of bandwidth, pushing data to and from its source, and then a big catch-all of governance, uh, security, compliance, and all of those things. Those are the four buckets that we see uh, that uh, that uh, that that exist in all those applications. Where I see the edges, uh, you know, as a service, as a play, um, and coming, evolving, will be to as we're seeing the public cloud providers deploy, realizing that they have to have the reach down to the edge. We're looking at deploying uh, micro data centers with 
edge as a service deployed infrastructure that could be running right alongside of it, Azure Stacks and AWS pods and, and everything right within the same cabinet so that it has that feel of connection to the cloud um, or not the connection and management of the cloud, but have that local autonomous, low latency, high bandwidth application serving there. And I've been working to try to, how can I deliver that with the same expectation of the way we consume cloud as, as a service on demand on a pay per month model. Not quite as easy to do in a distributed architecture, but that distributed architecture is gonna be the key because as we talked about, I believe the decentralized, I, decentralized nature of everything is really at the underpinning of what we're seeing in the edge deployment movement. So TJ, I, uh, I use the term uh, autonomous drone in uh, in referring to the edge a, a motionless autonomous drone um uh you've had a lot of experience with remote hands smart hands do you see that as being the way that we're going to manage the proliferation of the iot edge i think it's going to be part of it absolutely you know when when we talk about kind of the iot edge um you know you have uh, you truly do actually have autonomous vehicles that are actually operating based upon data sets that are being uh, gathered by these uh, devices, IoT devices, right? For example, going back to the agriculture example, right? So once one of these sensors picks up the information, uh, it can actually send out an autonomous vehicle to start automatically fertilizing an area of the agricultural land, right, if you want. And so there's all kinds of different ways that you can actually do it. Um, but I think that um, you're going to find a lot of innovation in the next few years are going to make that easier as we go on. So I'm going to jump right on to the next topic. I'm going to begin with Frank, if we can. Uh, I think we're all looking for 5G to proliferate at an increasing rate, the install rate, the, the install base to grow uh, exponentially without any question and that that's going to be a big driver of whatever happens at the edge that once again it's high speed low latency bandwidth that is the, mm -hmm. the driver for this so uh from a verizon perspective uh i mean you guys are all all over this <laughs> so uh how do you see it well um high speed is where it's at the you know the disconnection that i'm on right now it's 2D, but it's going to be 3D at some point. You're going to have uh, all sorts of things coming out at you. Um, you know, I might in, instead of going to the doctor to have some some work done on my arm, or you know, you know, minor surgery. You know, you put a laser pointer on the top of your laptop, and they can just boom right at home. Uh, we're not there yet, but if you check into a hospital, they can perform robotic surgery remotely. You can have the best, not just the best surgeon in town, you can have the best surgeon in the world working on you with these high-speed connections. Uh, think about it that way. The autonomous vehicles, absolutely. Uh, with these high-speed connections, you need to make the corrections on the fly. Um, you need to you know, get data out there, uh, doing uh, telemetry to, to all the vehicles around you. Uh, think about if you could adjust your, the speed of your vehicle based on the traffic pattern, uh, the, the timing of the traffic lights, so you never have to hit the brake. You just slow down a little bit and speed up a little bit not something that you can do I, I know i tried when i was uh much younger to to not hit the brakes as i'm driving down main street just in time the traffic lights but it, with all that feedback you can you know get much better uh, mileage on your vehicle on your on your gas mileage and much less wear and tear so it's going to help uh, the environment going to help help your pocket uh you're going to have the the best medical care anywhere you can do you know re remote you, you can harvest your fields hey you know what instead of harvesting field a we're going to harvest field b uh these, these high speed connections are going to get out there they're going to get closer and closer to everyone's home um in the, the smart cities how that things talk to each other uh calls bounce from from building to building person to person without having to, they can stay on the edge without having to go all the way back through a core network to do the processing you can get, a lot of that stuff can get processed right at the edge which makes that connection uh, the distance the, the information has to travel is shorter, coupled with these higher speed connections. It's, it's uh, light years ahead of where we were not that far, not that long ago. So San Diego, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this is exactly in your wheelhouse, but, uh, but you may have seen the issue. 
um, uh, often the data centers that are live that are out there, the, the old enterprise data centers uh, and, and a, back a generation or two of colo data centers, we're dealing with uh, obsolete facilities. Uh, what are the kinds of, you know, A, can obsolete data center facilities be reasonably upgraded? Or, or what is the answer to how you, you can design and develop uh, in legacy facilities that were not intended for the edge? Absolutely. So we have faced that challenge. Uh, and one of the, the advantages of the edge uh, presented to us is that you can have a distributed infrastructure. And by having a distributed infrastructure, you can uh, move loads right in, uh, in different regions or different places while you're basically giving a retrofit or, or you're uh, remodeling or adapting or upgrading a data center. Of course, you, can, you, you have seen these containerized solutions that are suitable for the edge. And not only for the edge, but precisely for that uh, topic, you can put a data center container, right? Uh, Motor data center, maybe in the, in the parking lot and move the infrastructure there while you're doing the retrofit for your existing data center, your legacy data center, while still being active and, and on service in parallel. And uh, normally what we have seen is that because of the demand of the needs, some of our clients has already put some containers while they're uh, you know, retrofitting or upgrading their existing data center. And once they're ready, they don't want to move away the containers either because uh, it gives them more capacity so they keep them both. So it's very interesting how the, the industry is evolving that by thinking in a, a temporal solution eventually it becomes permanent, right? Because it uh, uh, solves uh, a, a problem of uh, capacity constraint, right? Uh, in a very agile and quick way. So that's what we're seeing and um, answering your question, absolutely. You, there's a lot of alternatives and ways that you can retrofit an existing data center and Edge give us that flexibility too for doing that. Thank you, you got a thought about I, that? Absolutely, I just wanted to piggyback on what Santiago was saying. That's, I've, I've made uh, quite, quite a bit of work for myself doing exactly what Santiago is talking about. What we've tried to do uh, with varying degrees of success is design in pivot space. Um, the, the new gear is, uh, okay, this is semi-related. So it's the software defined network. So the gear is not, is more agnostic. It's not manufacturer specific. You can use off the shelf hardware with this new stuff, which is phenomenal. Uh, and it doesn't have to last you 20 years to, to be able to make a financial sense, it's going five years and the technology changes. So we're, our, uh, many of our designs incorporate the fact that we know we need pivot space. So if you have three rooms, one is your live room, one is your growing room. You can't see my hand there because I got the virtual background. One, one is your, your decrease, <laughs> no. <laughs> one is your decreasing capacity. So you want to have uh, a way to pivot around so you can roll the traffic into, depending on how long the designs go and the, the powers that be, whether or not they approve your projects in time, you may end up with a, with with a container box in your parking lot. Um, and nothing is as permanent as a temporary solution. <laughs> so um, as we, we've all seen that in our, in our past, you, you, your list of guys here, Santiago, you absolutely nailed that one. Um, but yeah, that's, you, you have to know that you're gonna be retrofitting. Uh, Verizon as a company has a lot of real estate out there. I would love to do Greenfield. I would, like I said, I would love to do Greenfield, but I'm not gonna. Uh, I, we just have too much real estate that we that we own and that we have long-term leases on. And the reality of it is, if we have that much usable space, why am I, you know, going out and building something brand new? I have to make a serious business case for a long-term why I can't. You know, it's got to. We we already have the property, so I got to use it. So. So Pete, you have to have. Uh face this numerous times. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's inevitable that we are going to have to find ways to improve the capability of the existing data center world, because in the United States, especially, um, we have one of the most aging fleet of data centers available. And I could tell you, if I have to build a data center today, I could actually build a data center for about 35% lower CapEx 
and OPEX than I could build a data center only five years ago because of all the great technologies that are out there. We use a lot of indirect evaporative cooling. We're using a lot of alternative fuel sources, using fuel sources to feed it as a primary A side. We're using some of the most cutting edge monitoring systems to enact the cooling that you uh, can do. All of those technologies, by the way, are very suited to the micro data center. I'm using the same things, immersive cooling at the edge. And one thing that's a trend that's consistent is density creates savings. So we need to pack things into smaller spaces, which means we're gonna to need to find ways to cool it and power it and do it in a more dense way. Just in this seminar alone, we've seen no less than two or three different immersive cooling guys. I could tell you they're off the hook. Just in the crypto mining space alone, we're seeing, uh, I'm, I'm talking to no less than three or four people that are using immersive cooling for the crypto mining space. May talk about an edge you know, deployment. We're deploying 1.5 megawatt containers you know, uh, you know, using immersive cooling. Um, immersive cooling could be a solution for Frank, putting him inside his, uh, you know, his pivot space just by creating density and dropping it inside there. And there's plenty of space there. You've got modular chillered solutions that are chillered per cabinet from DDC cabinet and another person who spoke um, just moments ago. And so there's lots of ways that we're going to have to skin the cat to both build new with higher capacity and capability, but also bring up to uh, newer standards, those aging facilities to create, uh, create that same level of um, efficiency, sustainability, greenness, uh, and uh, reliability. Yeah, and I think also was the form factor shrink, right? Because we discussed before, the cooling needs to get closer to the actual units, right? So you have uh, door chillers, you have coal plates, you know, and so as you're looking at a two by two, you know, uh, space where you're going to put a half rack, you know, do you want to put air conditioning unit or something in there or do you want to do something different, right? And so those are all kind of the conscious decisions you have to make as your four factor from edge, you know, gets smaller and smaller as well. To jump back to the design point, uh, I would like to add in that uh, in, in order to be able to adapt, this has to be very scalable, very replicable, uh, modular in nature, and I'm not talking about containers, I'm talking about at the cabinet level. Uh, I think, Pete, your comment about uh, immersion is, and, and Tony's comment about coal plate and some of the other cooling technologies that are out there play directly, and you're right, there was a speaker earlier on this very topic uh, without any question. Uh, so it, 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 it just seems to me that the design topology has to be one that is rapidly scalable, right? That that's how we're going to meet the growth demand without it breaking the bank, rather than building brand new shell structures at very large scale in order to fill in, to backfill as, as clients come along, customers come along, we're instead going to be looking for how quickly we can augment what we already have in place. Right? Yeah, so, you said it break the bank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Nicole, you had a, 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 this is an area where as you look at modularity and you look at scalability, does that present any new network uh, security issues, any what's your take? Well, if, you're, if you look at it from just a risk assessment perspective, you actually are lowering your risk when you have these clearly defined containerized type solutions, even if you're looking at from a modular cabinet, because you already have your proof of concept, complete, tested, done. And the idea is that you're replicating on a secure foundation. So whether you're developing software or innovating at the hardware or at the chip level, the idea is that you're always doing it from a secure standpoint and that you have your POCs, your proof of concepts already in place. So that once that's in, done, then in terms of rapid growth, rapid, even you know, rapid innovation, sky's the limit because you really have, again, that secure foundation. And that's one of the benefits of that from a design standpoint having things, the topology being very clear. Yeah, and I would think that having security as part of the design topology, if it isn't already, it absolutely has to be. It has to, absolutely. 
it, there's too great a risk. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this topic? We're we're coming down toward the end. Um, I, I want to. I'm going to push right on to what I think is uh, is the the meat of this. I'd like to have each of you look out ten years and tell me what you see, or five years, pick your number, and tell me what you see the edge uh, topography looking like on a global basis. What What's the future hold? So who wants to start with that? Uh, Frank, <laughs> I pick All you. All right, I, I'll, I have no problem starting with that. I think we're gonna have this very similar discussion in five years. I think the, the edge is gonna get redefined again. I think our phones in our pockets are going to be about the same size with some way of getting the screen bigger. What we want, maybe a projection on there. The, the hardware in the sites, we're going to start, we're, we're going to be second, maybe third generation of, of edge uh, technology out in the, those sites. They're going to be running hotter. Uh, the holdouts for the air cooling are going to be the dinosaurs. Um, I know that that's something that we we've, we've had been ingrained for so many years with no don't put anything liquid in your data center don't put anything liquid in, just don't even don't, don't even fireplace nothing and you come up with all these crazy ways to keep a liquid out of there and now we're going to start putting liquid in there and and people's minds are just exploding and it's it's not something that we want to do it's something we have to do because it's going to work if you've ever if you've ever gone swimming you know a you know a 65 degree day is pretty nice but 65 degrees we're in the water that's pretty cold your, your chips are doing the same thing. You want to cool them down. And we all know the, you know, it, it, the water is going to cool it or any liquid is going to cool it much faster than the air can, much more effectively. So we're going to see, you know, the air, air cooled is going to be maybe a, a backup system. That's going to be your plus one maybe. Um, but that's going to be going the way of the dodo bird. It's going to be, you know, the racks are going to be, the, the, the circuit cards are going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Your power, your your facilities, your your back room stuff is going to take up more room than your white space, uh, but substantially more, um, because it, you're going to need to churn out that power. So your generators, your backup generators, your batteries, you're going to see uh, the next generation of lithium ion batteries taking taking the place of any of those big big old wet cells that we have. I love those things; those are rock stars. But we need something something better, and that that's going to be another thing coming down the pipe. All right. Hey, uh, so uh, I, I want to quickly go around. Give me your your biggest ideas, and we're going to jump right to uh, the questions. Uh, so TJ. So a couple of years ago, I got involved with uh, architecting a a home medical center uh, for some high net worth individuals, and that has led fast forward a couple of years to modular telehealth clinics that can be like pop up clinics in different areas. I think as you look to different technologies and you look to how you would connect all the devices in the medical base to, you know, some sort of edge center within the containers where you can have two or four different rooms, right? I think that's going to be an interesting uh, utilization of edge and high speed as well. Santiago. So, uh, yeah, pretty much Frank and TJ, I agree with what they mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think the edge, uh, of course, will be a, a redesign of the edge. I don't know, maybe every four to five years uh, to adapt to the to the needs and requirements of every 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 year or every generation. But uh, I'll see. I will start. I think that the edge will cover different regions and not just the rural environments, but also the urban ones, right? Having edge in different blocks and different uh, buildings, right? Even even uh, if you go to downtown of many of the cities, you will see different buildings that will be covered in edge, maybe in each floor or so, right? Because it's becoming more granular, and it depends on how fast uh, you want the information. And there will be applications in five or ten years from now that we not even imagine, right? Because if you go back ten years ago. There are things that we're using now that they, they didn't even exist back then, right? So the needs, uh, the needs that the, the edge will need to, to, to support are not there even yet, most of them. Most of them, they are not even exist. So uh, I, I think the edge will evolve with them to, to serve their needs. 
Nicole, have you got a, a security uh, forecast to make for us? Oh, you don't want the forecast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it can be prevented. Um, from a technology standpoint, I'm going to say 10 years. I uh, definitely think from a net, if you're going like nanotechnology, I think that that's going to definitely be a certain immersive point for the edge. Um, again, thinking 10 years, but I also see too something that hasn't been brought up yet is the integration of satellite based into uh, internet delivery systems. And I think that's really going to start playing a huge, huge role in it's going to be more common, especially in delivery to rural systems in the next five years, maybe even less. I think that too, as we look at more of high availability designs that from a, a point of failure, that's gonna be like a real huge consideration because there's gonna be a large dependency on those type of solutions. So that, that's kind of like what I'm, I'm seeing. So I'm gonna jump right to questions now and Pete, I'm gonna skip over you because I'm gonna throw the first question to you. Got it. When we initially thought of the edge, many thought of rural tier two, three markets, but you all have changes that change that perception. How do we see the edge in urban and dense environments evolving from a facility standpoint? Yeah, I actually think it's an extension of what we were just talking about. So for me, the edge is this um, evolution so that in 10 years, the world is barely recognizable. Let's remember in 1900, right? I was still Tony Sebas Thunder. 1900 to 1910, we went from a completely horse-drawn society to a completely automated automotive society in less than 10 years without the internet, without mass communications. And it was an amazing transition. And we are about to see that same amazing transition happen in the next 10 years, quantum computing, telemedicine, all IOT that's going to happen. It's going to be unrecognizable. It all has one underpinning. It all has to be decentralized. We're going to be seeing the decentralization of everything, the decentralization of currencies we're already seeing happen, getting away from central banks to getting to decentralized currencies. We will see the digital assetization of everything so that they can be traded securely, encryptedly as, uh, you know, as secure endpoints to all over so that we can truly have a true digital asset that can be traded or moved. We're going to see the decentralization of the internet so that the guy who actually has the funny cat He's not just relying on the big giant hyper providers to be able to provide advertising. You will provide your own advertising that will be distributed amongst everybody. That is the greater momentum of what's happening in the decentralized world. As Muni Ali said, you know, who's running Blockstack right now, we're seeing the cycle change from, sorry. We're seeing the cycle change right now, right before us of moving us from the centralized to the decentralized yet again. And so I think that's the underpinning to everything that's going on right now is the decentralization of the world. And Santiago, I'm gonna throw the second question to you. What do you think about on-prem edge solutions that suit healthcare and higher types of end users? Do we see those types of edge solutions growing? Are we going to see cloud coming first and soon? So before you answer, I'm gonna suggest that every floor of every medical center has a telecom network closet, every floor. I see those every floor that used to be for telecom and networking in the healthcare environment becoming literally edge data centers. Not any question. So yeah. oh, you answer my question. <laughs> you answer. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we have a, uh, actually we have a business case study about that. We put an edge solution for a healthcare provider, the largest healthcare provider in Mexico, because actually, although we manage their core infrastructure, right, they needed to have edge um, uh, infrastructure distributed in their hospitals for certain applications that uh, needed to have very low latency and high resolution. For instance, the MRIs, the MRIs of the patients, right, some X-rays. So, to provide a very accurate, uh, precise diagnosis from the from the medical doctors, they need to have the tools uh, ready and uh, with a high quality, right? And in hospital, times matters. I, I think there's no more urgency or or, or where the quote uh, adapts better when times matter with the hospitals, right? Because this is you're saving lives. 
So I think on the healthcare is, is very critical to have a, a very quick response time for getting this type of tools or uh, telemedicine and some others that would require um, very low latency. So absolutely, edge uh, will be needed in, in every healthcare facility. And like you mentioned, we have already a bunch of that infrastructure that we can leverage on that to provide edge solutions there. So I'm gonna finish this out with two thoughts. One is, and it's been said before, the multiverse, AR, VR, interactivity, immersion, uh, the world of media is going to require a massive amount of bandwidth. So think about that. And then the last piece is quantum. Quantum computing is going to change the world. So everything that is can be HPC, AI enabled HPC at the edge will become quantum within the decade. And that's it for me. Great job, brother. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, everyone here. This has been a, a brilliant session. And of course,